Lord be with you. Y'all say it with me. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go to the house of the Lord. And I'm glad to be here, and I certainly hope that you are. I'm glad to be with you worshiping in the house of the Lord. And we are glad for all of those who are joining us uh, electronically this morning. It's been a wonderful means of staying in communication with people. And I, again, extend an invitation to any of you who are watching online, if you've not yet had the opportunity or taken the opportunity to visit us in person, we would be most honored by that. But we want to say a special welcome to everybody who's here, particularly old friends who have returned and graced us with their presence this morning. It is just a delight, I'm going to name it, it's a delight to see the Bioni family here uh, in church with us again. And we're just really glad that y'all are here. And if you thought you could just slip in, sit near the back and not be noticed, <laughs> You are very much mistaken. It's good to have y'all here. It is really good to have y'all here. Uh, just a couple of things. We, this is a communion service, and we will be serving communion to you. Myself and two elders will bring it to you where you are seated. Um, that's pretty self-explanatory. Uh, we've got some announcements, don't we, Cindy? Uh, yes. Uh, just a reminder that the Outreach Committee has a meeting after church in the Fellowship Hall. Look forward to seeing bunch of you. And then next Saturday from 12 to 3, we will have our quarterly gap food drive, and I'll be parked by the Fellowship Hall, so just bring them in. <laughs> All right. You. Very good. Any other announcements this morning? Uh, well, hearing none, will you stand in body or spirit as we sing Psalm number 1, and the tune you'll find is familiar, and the words come from the very first psalm. <laughs> in our invitation to worship. To all who are weary and need rest. To all who mourn and long for comfort. To all who feel worthless and wonder if God cares. To all who fail and desire strength. 
to all who sin and need a savior. This church opens wide her doors with a greeting from Jesus Christ. The healer of the broken, the defender of the guilty, the friend of sinners. Welcome. Welcome. Good morning. morning. Let us bow our heads in prayer. Lord, we thank you that you alone are our refuge and strong tower. We thank you that no matter what we face, you are still on the throne. You are still in control and nothing can ever stand against you. Thank you that you hold the victory in this world and you have promised in your word that you will be with us through any hardship we may face. You are always trustworthy. You are all powerful. You are fully able. You are Lord over every situation, no matter how difficult it may seem. You are our healer and will never waste the pain we carry today. You promise to use all things for good in some way because you are a God of miracles and nothing is too difficult for you. Amen. Amen. if we say that we're not sinners, we're fooling nobody but ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all our unrighteousness. So then let us make confession together. Merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with all our heart and mind and strength and have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. In your mercy, forgive what we have been, transform what we are and direct what we shall be that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Oh, hear the good news. The mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting, and as far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. And I declare to you in the name of Jesus Christ that you and I are truly, truly forgiven. Amen. Our hymn is Through the Love of God, Our Savior, and you may remain seated.
We now come to that time in our service when we bring before God the celebrations and the concerns of our hearts. And you may have heard this, but Betsy Penrow has become a great-grandmother again. I think this is great-grandchild number four, and everybody's doing well. But please congratulate her on that great uh, celebration. Um, we've got a number of folks for whom we need to be in prayer for traveling mercies. Uh, we want to say thank you that traveling mercies were available for Yvette on her trip out to the West Coast to see her family and her grandsons, whom she's not seen before this in, what, five years, Yvette? But it's good to have you back this morning. Uh, but I believe Dave and uh, Ann Iverson are in New York, I want to say. And Bill and Janet Cravens are roughing it at the beach. Um, <laughs> And Sheila Tucker is feeling well enough to have traveled to Maryland to be with family up there. So, Sheila, if you're watching this morning, we love you, and we're glad you're feeling that well. And we'd like for you to come back as soon as you can safely. Um, Ann Jones, uh, continue in prayer with her, but she has finished the last round of the mega doses of chemotherapy that she's undergoing for her leukemia. And so far, seems to be holding up all right. Uh, she's got another, what, year or two, I guess, of one year of, of maintenance stuff that'll go on, but she's continuing that fight, and please lift her and her husband Jacob and their children up uh, in prayer, and thank you for your continuing love uh, for them. Um, I do have a personal note, some of you may remember. 14 years ago this week, I was ordained and installed as a pastor of St. Andrew Presbyterian Church. And I can say without equivocation, it is the 14 best years of my life. Y'all have been so good to me and to my family through so much stuff. It is a privilege and an honor and a joy to serve you in this way. And I'm looking forward to the next 14 years. Um, yeah, you're in trouble now. Uh, <laughs> we should also remember that the day is the 77th anniversary of D-Day. We don't hear much about World War II stuff anymore. There have been so many wars in between then and now that our uh, attention has been drawn elsewhere, but we should never forget the sacrifice that was made. 150,000 Allied troops stormed ashore on the beaches of Normandy in a desperate attempt to throw back the forces of darkness. And you know, war is a terrible thing, but if you can say there was a good war, I think that was a good war. It had a little more clarity around the lines. There was evil perpetrated on both sides, and we know that, but we should never, ever, ever forget the sacrifice, especially of those who stormed those beaches. The first waves of soldiers lost up to 90% of the groups that were coming off the boats. There's a town in Virginia, I think it's called Bedford, where 19 young men who were in the Army Reserve, all from that one town, they died in that first wave. The pain and suffering for those families goes on today, but their sacrifice was not in vain. And they fought for one thing, so that we might remain free. This country has always been about freedom and trying to figure out what the boundaries and structure of liberty and freedom look like. And there are questions today about what freedom and liberty ought to look like for all the citizens of this country. But we have to promise ourselves that we will not let their sacrifice be in vain, that we will continue to press on into becoming a nation where there is truly liberty and justice for all our citizens. And as Christians, even as fond as we are of this nation, we have to always remember that we are citizens first and foremost of the kingdom of heaven. And our allegiance ultimately is to a king, not to a president, not to a party, not to a political platform. And our goal is to see that this reality becomes true, that there is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, but that we are all one in Christ Jesus. The church has a unique opportunity in this turbulent time to speak with a voice of love and welcome and compassion. And we are the ones who are supposed to be teaching the world what it looks like. That people from different backgrounds and races and creeds and all the rest of it can somehow figure out how to not just tolerate each other, but in fact love one another through the grace of God that has been poured into our hearts through Jesus Christ. That is something that is far beyond us. But the good news is God equips those he calls. 
And therefore, we have been given the Holy Spirit and the Word of God and each other to accomplish this task. So that should be our most fervent prayer in these strange hours. And we remember that God is in charge of it all. So let us now go to God in prayer. Loving and gracious Father, your people are gathered before you this morning to praise your name, to honor and glorify you for who you are and for what you have done and what you are doing in our lives. You have blessed us with so much, O oh God, and we confess that we have not been grateful. We confess that we have taken your blessings for granted, and we confess that we have not done a good job of sharing them with others. We confess, Father, that we look at the world and we hear this constant bombardment of negative news. We hear this constant appeal to be drawn into different groups and set against one another and strive in ways that are hateful and spiteful and to use each other for our own goals. And we ask you, God, to put a barrier between us and all that noise. Help us to feed deeply on your word and be nourished by your spirit that we might stand in contrast to this conflicted old world and not merely stand in contrast to it, Lord, but be quick to look for ways to serve others in the name of Jesus Christ. God, these are crazy times. We have gone through a pandemic. There is unprecedented racial strife that has erupted in this country as a result of the centuries of misuse and mistreatment. And we are struggling, struggling, Lord, with figuring out what is a good way forward. Help us to remember that the only way forward is your way, the way of Jesus Christ, the way of humility, the way of service, the way that speaks of truth but speaks of truth above all in love. So, Father, help us to be people of truth and love. Help us to extend your grace to all those whom we meet. Prompt us by your spirit to deal with each person that we meet by the power of love. Remind us that everyone we see is made in your immortal image and that other people, no matter how distasteful their views or indeed how awful they may be acting, remind us that other people are not our enemy. Our enemy, Father, seeks to deceive the world. Our enemy has wrapped the world in lies. Our enemy offers false satisfaction through all sorts of idols. Oh, God, help us to tear down all the idols in our hearts that you might reign supreme there, that we might cherish the love of Jesus Christ alone above all things, that we might become shaped into his image. Use our worship, use our prayer, use our acts of service to discipline us into the way of Jesus Christ. Father, we confess it doesn't feel natural to us, and we rebel against the yoke that you would put upon us. Remind us, as Jesus said, that his yoke is easy and his burden is light, and that if we would just walk in his way, we would find the joy and the peace that have been promised to those who are faithful to him. God, help us to share that joy and peace. Help us to be in constant prayer for those around the globe who are persecuted for bearing the name of Jesus Christ. Help us to see ways we might serve others in this community that they might know that the love of Christ is real. 
Help us to always be open to whatever new thing you are calling us to do while we remain faithful to the holiness to which you have called us. All this is far beyond us, Father. And we confess that we feel overwhelmed some days just getting up in the morning. So we ask you, God, to give us a fresh burst of your spirit. Let us be bathed in it. Let us drink it in that we might be filled with you and that you might be what others see when they see us. This is audacious to ask, and yet it is what you have promised. That as Jesus is the light of the world and has shared his light with us, you have commissioned us to be a light in dark places, to be warmth in the cold places, to be love in the unloved places. God, let it be so. Let us embrace this challenge with joy, knowing that in Jesus Christ we have already won every victory that needs to be won, and to remember that one day, oh God, one day our Savior will return. Put everything to rights. Perfect justice and perfect mercy will be on display. And all will bow the knee and proclaim Jesus Christ as Lord. Oh Lord, we long for that day. But we ask you to show us how to live until that day. And above all, that we would be eager to share the good news of Christ with those who do not yet understand it. Give us your wisdom and your courage and above all the love to do these things. And we make our prayer in the name of our Savior, Jesus, who taught us that when we pray, we should say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Good morning. Good morning. Listen to God's word. The Old Testament reading is from Isaiah chapter 43, verses 18 and 19. Remember the former things, not consider the things, nor consider the things of old. Behold, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. The New Testament reading is from Luke chapter 5, verses 33 through 39. A question about fasting. And they said to him, the disciples of John has fast often and offers prayers. And so do the disciples of the Pharisees. But yours eat and drink. And Jesus said to them, can you make wedding guests fast while the bridegroom is with them? The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast in those days. He also told a parable. No one tears a piece from a new garment and put it on an old garment. If he does, he will tear the new, the new and the piece from the new will not match the old and no one puts new wine into old wineskins. If he does, the new wine will burst the skins and it will be spilled and the skins will be destroyed. But new wine must be put into fresh wineskins. And no one, after drinking old wine, desires new, for he says the old is good. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And let me just say thank you to Patty and Charlie and the choir for that beautiful anthem. And I don't know if you noticed, but the average age of the choir this morning has dropped considerably. <laughs> Because Isadora Kitchen, who's got a beautiful voice, has joined us this morning. I just want to thank you for being a part of this. Let us pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, send your spirit upon us now, quickly and fully, that our minds would be open and our hearts would be full, and that we would seek your will and your way above all things. Let us hear what you have for us this day in your word. And in hearing it, let us be joyfully obedient to your call. Now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, we are picking back up this morning in the Gospel of Luke where we left off uh, before we started the Easter season. And I need to give you some context for the verses that we just heard from the fifth chapter of, of Luke. You might remember that in the verses just before this, Jesus has called Levi, the tax collector, to leave everything behind and become his disciple. And you'll recall how radical that was because tax collectors were universally hated. You'll remember they're considered traitors to their own people. They collaborated with the Romans, and whatever they could collect, they could keep. Uh, and the Romans didn't care if they cheated folks as long as the Romans got their share. So Levi was a member of a very special and very despised group of people. And you'll remember that after Levi was called to be a disciple, he threw a party for Jesus at his home and invited all his friends. And him being a tax collector, his friends would have been other tax collectors, and then we're not 100% clear, but I think Scripture implies strongly that there might have been some women there uh, who charged by the hour. We'll, we'll, we'll just leave it at that. 
Uh, and the Pharisees, who apparently spent most of their time snooping around trying to catch people doing something wrong, are just all outdone about this party. And Luke says they were grumbling to Jesus' disciples, saying, how come y'all are eating and drinking with tax collectors and sinners? And we have to remember always that to have table fellowship in that day with one another, to sit across the table and break bread and drink wine and to eat together, wasn't just a matter of being polite. It exemplified welcome and acceptance, a, a full degree of engaging with one another. And Jesus says, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. And, you know, that goes right over the Pharisees' heads because they figured they were already <laughs> righteous and didn't have anything to repent for. And so what we're looking at today is a continuation of that conversation. And the Pharisees didn't get what they thought was a satisfactory answer to their first question, so they ask another. And they're like, John's disciples, John the Baptist's disciples, fast frequently, and they pray a lot, and so do ours, but your crew just eats and drinks all the time. You know, this attitude reminds me of something that the journalist from the early part of the 20th century, a guy named H.L. Mencken, he wrote that the spirit of Puritanism is where the haunting fear that someone, somewhere, may be happy. <laughs> I think that that's expressive of the Pharisees' point of view in the world. Now, it's easy to bash the Pharisees. It's kind of fun. They can be an easy target. But we need to remember that they really thought they were trying to glorify God. And so all the habits and practices and disciplines and rule following that they prescribed were designed... They thought to keep them in good standing with God, and we have to be so careful that we don't get infected with the same virus. It is all too easy, isn't it, to add on extra requirements to what it means to be a real Christian. And if we're not careful, we end up in the same place as the Pharisees, people trying to demonstrate our own righteousness, which then takes the place of the gospel of grace. And Paul talks about this phenomenon at length in the book of Galatians, which was written to address some false teaching that had crept into the church already. This is, this is still the first century, still the first half of the first century. And there were those who had begun to insist that in order to be a true Christian, you really had to be a Jew first. And the most important thing about that was you needed to be circumcised. It was necessary for salvation. So they're adding packed parts of the Jewish law on top of the gospel, which in effect undercuts it completely. And Paul writes in Galatians chapter 1, beginning at the 6th verse, I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another one, but there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we, or an angel from God, should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we originally preached to you, let him be accursed. And we need to be crystal clear on this. Our salvation is not based on anything more than putting our faith and our trust in what Jesus Christ did for us at the cross. It's not Jesus plus doing good deeds. It's not Jesus plus the right stance on global warming or nuclear power or human sexuality or nationalism or racism or anything else. We are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Jesus Christ alone. You hear me? I want you all to say that with me. We are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Jesus Christ alone. Amen and amen. Paul hammers this home in Ephesians chapter 2. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not the result of works, so that no one may boast. Salvation by faith and not by works was always evident, actually, in the Old Testament. We forget this. But you go all the way back to the story of Abraham in the 15th chapter of Genesis. And God told Abram that he and Sarah would have a child, a son of their own, even though they were both well past the age of conceiving a child. And verse 6 says, Abram believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. But by the time of Jesus, the emphasis was not on putting your trust in God's righteousness for you, but in your own righteousness. And this had become totally obscured as teachers like the Pharisees kept layering more and more things 
on top of it. And so when they ask about fasting and praying, it's because they'd put together an outline of specific behaviors that marked you as somebody who belonged to God. It helped demonstrate how righteous you were, and it helped you score points with God. It was a great system. And that program had three main elements, prayer, fasting, and the giving of alms, contributing for the needs of the poor. It was a long-established tradition that prayers to be offered three times a day, at 9 a.m. and at noon and at 3 p.m. You'll remember 9 a.m. and 3 p.m. were the hours of the morning and evening sacrifice, and the one in the middle is just for good measure. Uh, and when you went up to the temple for prayer, it was also customary to give alms to the poor. And there were these containers outside the doors of the temple. They were sort of open at the top, and you would throw your money in before you went in to the temple. Um, and the other feature was fasting, which the Pharisees did twice a week on Mondays and Thursdays. They didn't eat or drink a thing. And you'll remember from the Sermon on the Mount that Jesus, Jesus mentions all three of these things. He's touching the base that others were concerned about. Matthew chapter 6, he says, Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them, for then you'll have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. And he talks about giving to the poor. He talks about prayer. He talks about fasting. And he says all these things are to be done privately. They're to be done, but they're to be done privately, not for public display. Jesus isn't opposed to prayer or giving to the poor or fasting, but he expects it to be done to the glory of God and not our own glory. By the way, a uh, trivia question, how many times in the Old Testament do we find the command to fast? Anybody know? Once. Once. It's on the Day of Atonement, the holy day where you make penitence for your sins, the day when the high priest would go in the Holy of Holies and offer sins for all the people. Everybody was supposed to fast on that day. That's the only day that the Old Testament law called for fasting. But the Pharisees somehow twisted that into a twice-a-week requirement. And so when they ask, how come y'all don't fast and pray, they're basically asking, how come y'all don't do them the way we do them, which is, of course, the right way. And this is the hallmark of the Pharisees' mindset, this business of pointing out how much more righteous they were than everybody else. And when you had these external markers, it was easy to see. I see that you're eating, and it's a Monday. Oh, well... Shame on you. Um, mm. But Jesus says, how can the wedding guests fast while the bridegroom is still with them? When the bridegroom is taken away, then they will fast. All right, who's the bridegroom? Jesus is the bridegroom. And he's saying that it makes no sense to practice fasting, which is all about mourning and sadness and penitence, when you're in the middle of a wedding feast. And in fact, in other rabbinical writings, it was forbidden to fast during a wedding. And you'll remember a wedding went on for a whole week, so that'd blow the whole Monday-Thursday thing. You couldn't fast during a wedding. It was too joyful. It was too much of a celebration. That's a terrible time to think about fasting. And this is a powerful image for us to hold on to. You know, the church is referred to as the bride of Christ. And there's this beautiful picture in the 19th chapter of Revelation of what our great reunion with Jesus will be like. John writes this, Then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude, like the roar of many waters and a, like the sound of mighty peals of thunder, crying out, Hallelujah! For the Lord our God, the Almighty, reigns. Let us rejoice and exult and give him the glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. It was granted her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure, for the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. And the angel said to me, write this, Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage feast of the Lamb. And I promise you all, there will not be any fasting on that day or any other after it. And Jesus is trying to explain to those Pharisees why it would have been absolutely wrong for his disciples to fast while he was present with them. So he gives them a couple of examples. He said it'd be like tearing off a piece of fabric from a new garment and putting it on an old one. You'll ruin the new one and, and the patch will not match the old one. That's just stupid. And he also compares it to putting new wine into old wineskins. A wineskin, you might recall, was made from the skin of a goat. 
And when it is first made, the skin is still flexible and supple. It gives. So when new wine, which is still fermenting, is put into it, there's room for it to expand. And if you put new wine in an old, brittle wine skin, there's no elbow room at all. And when it expands, it explodes. The wine gets wasted, and the skin is ruined. New wine has to go into new wine skins. So what is this new wine that he is talking about? It is the new wine of grace. It is the new wine of the forgiveness of God offered not because we have done enough righteous deeds to earn God's favor, but solely, solely because of the love of God. You know these words by heart. John three, sixteen, where God did what? So love the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. And verse 17 is equally important. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. That is the new wine. It is this wine of grace and love of God poured out on undeserving sinners poured out on the unloved and the unlovely, poured out on tax collectors and prostitutes and all the outcasts, as well as the rest of us garden variety sinners, you know, the, the greedy and the gluttons and the gossips, people who can't hold their tongues or their tempers, all who have tried to find meaning and purpose in life apart from the only source of life itself, Jesus Christ our Lord. And the Pharisees of this world just don't get it. Verse 39, Jesus utters these sad words. And no one, after drinking the old wine, desires the new. Where he says the old is good. The truth is that those who are wrapped up in their own righteousness, uh, those who believe they are good enough for God without humbling themselves through repentance, they just want to keep on drinking that old rot gut because they've invested so much of themselves in it. But David declares in Psalm 34, verse 8, it's one of my favorite verses. O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. In order to really appreciate that new wine, our tastes and appetites have to change, which is the work of the Holy Spirit. And we should all pray fervently that we would hunger and thirst not only for new wine, just only for the new wine, and never sneak back into the cellar for a glass of the old stuff. We should also pray for those who are addicted to the old wine that they might get a really good shot of the new and be transformed so much that they want nothing else. There's a streaming series that's available now. I've mentioned to you several times, and I really hope you watch it. It's called The Chosen. It's about the life of Jesus, and I recommend it very highly. And in the episode where Jesus invites Levi the tax collector to become one of his disciples. Simon Peter's mind is just blown. And he says to Jesus, he said, So, we're including tax collectors now. That's different. And Jesus looks at him and says, Get used to different. Get used to different. And that is Jesus' message to all those who seek to approach God on their own terms. All those whose favorite game is to measure how much holier they are than somebody else. All those who use religion as a weapon to exclude the others who they don't think of as worthy. What the Pharisees didn't get and what all self-righteous people don't understand is that no one is righteous before God and every last one of us is in deep, deep need of grace, which is found in Jesus Christ alone. And what is news to some folks is that no one is so good that they don't need God's grace. But the really good news is that no one is so bad that the grace of God in Christ does not include them. Mm. Isaiah prophesied this very thing. Behold, I am doing a new thing. It springs forth now. Do you not perceive it? Friends, believe the good news and taste and see that the Lord is good. And get used to different. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. <clears throat>
this table where we remember the sacrifice of our Savior Jesus on behalf of undeserving sinners. We come to this table to taste and see that the Lord is good. So you remember that on the night our Lord was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it. He said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Take and eat, all of you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same manner, after supper, he took the cup. And when he had blessed it, he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for your sins. Take and drink, all of you. Do this in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat and drink this bread and this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let us pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, we know that we are absolutely not worthy to be here. And yet, by the blood of our Savior Jesus, you have declared us worthy. That we are somehow, somehow credited with his goodness and righteousness. And we don't understand the math. And we can't work it out in our heads. Just remind us, Lord, this day that we are loved. And that there is nothing that can separate us from your love for us in Jesus Christ, our Savior. Pour out your Holy Spirit now upon these gifts of bread and wine and upon us. And consecrate these elements and consecrate us as we feast on your goodness. As we taste and see that you are good. As we are nurtured by this spiritual meal and strengthened and empowered to become the people you have called us to be until that day when you call us home. For we ask it in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never hunger. Whoever believes in me will never thirst again. And I remind you, this is not the table of the Presbyterian Church, but the table of the Lord. And to this table, he invites all who truly repent of their sins and seek to live in newness of life with God and with one another. If that's you, then this is your place. The gifts of God for the people of God. Come.
take and eat, all of you. Do this in remembrance of me. blood of Christ. Take and drink, all of you. Do this in remembrance of me. <clears throat> Let us pray. O oh Lord, you have brought us to your banqueting table, and your banner over us is love. And what can we say but thank you? Grant, Father, that we would be so filled with new wine today that it would pour out of us into our neighbors and our friends and our families that they would taste and see that you indeed are good. Be with us and bless us. Guide us and keep us. And let all things be done in the joy of the Lord this day and all days. For it's in Jesus' name that we ask it. Amen. Praise God from whom all And now let us affirm together what it is we believe by answering the first question from the Heidelberg Catechism. What is your only comfort in life and in death? That I belong, body and soul, in life and in death, not to myself, but to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ, who at the cost of his own blood has fully paid for all my sins, and has completely freed me from the dominion of the devil, that he protects me so well 
that without the will of my Father in heaven, not a hair can fall from my head. Indeed, that everything must fit his purpose for my salvation. Therefore, by his Holy Spirit, he also assures me of eternal life and makes me wholeheartedly willing and ready from now on to live for him. Our closing hymn is Victory in Jesus. join me in the charge. He has showed you what is good and what does the Lord require of you to do justice, love mercy, and walk humbly with your God. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you peace this day, now and forever. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.